Chapter 10 With a tact which avoided the difficulties of a late appearance on the scene of action, the women were the first to arrive. They wished to be on their own ground. Pons introduced his friend Schmucke, who seemed to his fair visitors to be an idiot. Their heads were so full of the eligible gentleman with the four millions of francs that they paid but little attention to the worthy Pons's dissertations upon matters of which they were completely ignorant. They looked with indifferent eyes at Petitot's enamels, spaced over crimson velvet, set in three frames of marvellous workmanship. Flowers by Van Heysen, David and Heim, butterflies painted by Abraham Mignon, Van Eyck's, undoubted Cranach and Albrecht Dürer's, the Giorgioni, the Sebastian del Piombo, Backhuysen, Hobema, Jericho, the rarities of painting, none of these things so much as aroused their curiosity. They were waiting for the sun to arise and shine upon these treasures. Still, they were surprised by the beauty of some of the Etruscan trinkets, and the solid value of the snuff-boxes, and out of politeness they went into ecstasies over some Florentine bronzes which they held in their hands, when Madame Cibot announced Monsieur Brunner. They did not turn. They took advantage of a superb Venetian mirror framed in huge masses of carved ebony to scan this phoenix of eligible young men. Frédéric, forewarned by Wilhelm, had made the most of the little hair that remained to him. He wore a neat pair of trousers, a soft shade of some dark color, a silk waistcoat of superlative elegance and the very newest cut, a shirt with open work, its linen hand-woven by a Friesland woman, and a blue and white cravat. His watch-chain, like the head of his cane, came from Messieurs Florent and Chenor, and the coat, cut by old Graff himself, was of the very finest cloth. The suede gloves proclaimed the man who had run through his mother's fortune. You could have seen the banker's neat little brougham and pair of horses mirrored in the surface of his speckless, varnished boots, even if two pairs of sharp ears had not already caught the sound of wheels outside in the Rue de Normandie. When the prodigal of twenty years is a kind of chrysalis from which a banker emerges at the age of forty, the said banker is usually an observer of human nature, and so much the more shrewd if, as in Brunner's case, he understands how to turn his German simplicity to good account. He had assumed for the occasion the abstracted air of a man who is hesitating between family life and the dissipations of bachelorhood. This expression in a Frenchified German seemed to Cécile to be in the highest degree romantic. The descendant of the Virlaz was a second Werther in her eyes. Where is the girl who will not allow herself to weave a little novel about her marriage? Cécile thought herself the happiest of women when Brunner, looking round at the magnificent works of art so patiently collected during forty years, waxed enthusiastic, and Pons, to his no small satisfaction, found an appreciative admirer of his treasures, for the first time in his life. "'He is poetical,' the young lady said to herself. "'He sees millions in the things. A poet is a man that cannot count and leaves his wife to look after his money, an easy man to manage and amuse with trifles. Every pane in the two windows was a square of Swiss painted glass, the least of them was worth a thousand francs, and Pons possessed sixteen of these unrivalled works of art, for which amateurs seek so eagerly nowadays. In 1815 the panes could be bought for six or ten francs apiece, the value of the glorious collection of pictures, flawless great works, authentic, untouched since they left the master's hands, could only be proved in the fiery furnace of a sale-room. Not a picture but was set in a costly frame. There were frames of every kind, Venetians carved with heavy ornaments, like English plate of the present day. Romans distinguishable among the others for a certain dash that artists call fla-fla, Spanish wreaths in bold relief, 
flemings and germans with quaint figures tortoise-shell frames inlaid with copper and brass and mother-of-pearl and ivory frames of ebony and boxwood in the styles of louis treize louis quatorze louis quinze and louis seize in short it was a unique collection of the finest models pons luckier than the art museums of dresden and vienna possessed a frame by the famous brustoloni the michelangelo of wood-carvers mademoiselle de marville naturally asked for explanations of each new curiosity and was initiated into the mysteries of art by brunner her exclamations were so childish she seemed so pleased to have the value and beauty of the paintings carvings or bronzes pointed out to her that the german gradually thawed and looked quite young again and both were led on further than they intended at this purely accidental first meeting the private view lasted for three hours brunner offered his arm when cecile went downstairs as they descended slowly and discreetly cecile still talking fine art wondered that m brunner should admire her cousin's gimcracks so much do you really think that these things that we have just seen are worth a great deal of money mademoiselle if your cousin would sell his collection i would give eight hundred thousand francs for it this evening and i should not make a bad bargain the pictures alone would fetch more than that at a public sale since you say so i believe it returned she the things took up so much of your attention that it must be so oh mademoiselle protested brunner for all answer to your reproach i will ask your mother's permission to call so that i may have the pleasure of seeing you again how clever she is that little girl of mine thought the presidente following closely upon her daughter's heels aloud she said with the greatest pleasure monsieur i hope that you will come at dinner-time with our cousin pons the president will be delighted to make your acquaintance thank you cousin the lady squeezed pons's arm with deep meaning she could not have said more if she had used the consecrated formula let us swear an eternal friendship the glance which accompanied that thank you cousin was a caress when the young lady had been put into the carriage and the jobbed brougham had disappeared down the rue charlot brunner talked bric-a-brac to pons and pons talked marriage then you see no obstacle said pons oh said brunner she is an insignificant little thing and the mother is a trifle prim we shall see a handsome fortune one of these days more than a million good-bye till monday interrupted the millionaire if you should care to sell your collection of pictures i would give you five or six hundred thousand francs ah said pons he had no idea that he was so rich but they are my great pleasure in life and i could not bring myself to part with them i could only sell my collection to be delivered after my death very well we shall see here we have two affairs afoot said pons he was thinking only of the marriage brunner shook hands and drove away in his splendid carriage pons watched it out of sight he did not notice that Remonanc was smoking his pipe in the doorway that evening madame de marville went to ask advice of her father-in-law and found the whole popinot family at the camusot's house it was only natural that a mother who had failed to capture an eldest son should be tempted to take her little revenge so madame de marville threw out hints of the splendid marriage that her cecile was about to make whom can cecile be going to marry was the question upon all lips and cecile's mother without suspecting that she was betraying her secret let fall words and whispered confidences afterwards supplemented by madame berthier till gossip circulating in the bourgeois empyrean where pons accomplished his gastronomical evolutions took something like the following form cecile de marville is engaged to be married to a young german a banker from philanthropic motives for he has four millions he is like a hero in a novel a perfect werther charming and kind-hearted 
he has sown his wild oats and he is distractedly in love with cecile it is a case of love at first sight and so much the more certain since cecile had all pons's paintings of madonnas for rivals and so forth and so forth two or three of the set came to call on the presidente ostensibly to congratulate but really to find out whether or not the marvellous tale were true for their benefit madame de marville executed the following admirable variations on the theme of son-in-law which mothers may consult as people used to refer to the complete letter-writer a marriage is not an accomplished fact she told madame chiffreville until you have been in the mayor's office and the church we have only come as far as a personal interview so i count upon your friendship to say nothing of our hopes you are very fortunate madame marriages are so difficult to arrange in these days what can one do it was chance but marriages are often made in that way ah well so you are going to marry cecile said madame cardot yes said cecile's mother fully understanding the meaning of the so we were very particular or cecile would have been established before this but now we have found everything we wish money good temper good character and good looks and my sweet little girl certainly deserves nothing less Monsieur brunner is a charming young man most distinguished he is fond of luxury he knows life he is wild about cecile he loves her sincerely and in spite of his three or four millions cecile is going to accept him we had not looked so high for her still store is no sore it was not so much the fortune as the affection inspired by my daughter which decided us the president told madame lebas m brunner is in such a hurry that he wants the marriage to take place with the least possible delay is he a foreigner yes madame but i am very fortunate i confess no i shall not have a son-in-law but a son m brunner's delicacy has quite won our hearts no one would imagine how anxious he was to marry under the dotal system it is a great security for families he is going to invest twelve hundred thousand francs in grazing land which will be added to marville some day more variations followed on the morrow for instance m brunner was a great lord doing everything in lordly fashion he did not haggle if m de marville could obtain letters of naturalization qualifying m brunner for an office under government and the home secretary surely could strain a point for m de marville his son-in-law would be a peer of france nobody knew how much money m brunner possessed he had the finest horses and the smartest carriages in paris and so on and so on from the pleasure with which the camusots published their hopes it was pretty clear that this triumph was unexpected immediately after the interview in pons's museum m de marville at his wife's insistence begged the home secretary his chief and the attorney for the crown to dine with him on the occasion of the introduction of this phoenix of a son-in-law the three great personages accepted the invitation albeit it was given on short notice they all saw the part that they were to play in the family politics and readily came to the father's support in france we are usually pretty ready to assist the mother of marriageable daughters to hook an eligible son-in-law the count and countess papineau likewise lent their presence to complete the splendor of the occasion although they thought the invitation in questionable taste there were eleven in all cecile's grandfather old camusot came of course with his wife to a family reunion purposely arranged to elicit a proposal from m brunner the camusot de marvilles had given out that the guest of the evening was one of the richest capitalists in germany a man of taste he was in love with the little girl a future rival of the nucingens kellers du Tillets, and their like it is our day said the presidente with elaborate simplicity when she had named her guests one by one for the german whom she already regarded as her son-in-law 
we have only a few intimate friends first my husband's father who as you know is sure to be raised to the peerage monsieur le comte and madame la comtesse papineau whose son was not thought rich enough for cecile the home secretary our first president our attorney for the crown our personal friends in short we shall be obliged to dine rather late to-night because the chamber is sitting and people cannot get away before six brunner looked significantly at pons and pons rubbed his hands as if to say our friends you see my friends madame de marville as a clever tactician had something very particular to say to her cousin that cecile and her werther might be left together for a moment cecile chattered away volubly and contrived that frederic should catch sight of a german dictionary a german grammar and a volume of goethe hidden away in a place where he was likely to find them ah are you learning german asked brunner flushing red for laying traps of this kind the frenchwoman has not her match oh how naughty you are she cried it is too bad of you monsieur to explore my hiding-places like this i want to read goethe in the original she added i have been learning german for two years then the grammar must be very difficult to learn for scarcely ten pages have been cut brunner remarked with much candor cecile abashed turned away to hide her blushes a german cannot resist a display of this kind brunner caught cecile's hand made her turn and watched her confusion under his gaze after the manner of the heroes of the novels of auguste la fontaine of chaste memory you are adorable said he cecile's petulant gesture replied so are you who could help liking you it is all right mamma she whispered to her parent who came up at that moment with pons the sight of a family party on these occasions is not to be described everybody was well satisfied to see a mother put her hand on an eligible son-in-law compliments double-barrelled and double-charged were paid to brunner who pretended to understand nothing to cecile on whom nothing was lost and to the presidente who fished for them pons heard the blood singing in his ears the light of all the blazing gas-jets of the theatre footlight seemed to be dazzling his eyes when cecile in a low voice and with the most ingenious circumspection spoke of her father's plan of the annuity of twelve hundred francs the old artist positively declined the offer bringing forward the value of his fortune in furniture only now made known to him by brunner the home secretary the first president the attorney for the crown the popinots and those who had other engagements all went and before long no one was left except m camusot senior and cardot the old notary and his assistant and son-in-law berthier pons worthy soul looking round and seeing no one but the family blundered out a speech of thanks to the president and his wife for the proposal which cecile had just made to him so it is with those who are guided by their feelings they act upon impulse brunner hearing of an annuity offered in this way thought that it had very much the look of a commission paid to pons he made an israelite's return upon himself his attitude told of more than cool calculation meanwhile pons was saying to his astonished relations my collection or its value will in any case go to your family whether i come to terms with our friend brunner or keep it the camusots were amazed to hear that pons was so rich brunner watching saw how all these ignorant people looked favorably upon a man once believed to be poor so soon as they knew that he had great possessions he had seen too already that cecile was spoiled by her father and mother he amused himself therefore by astonishing the good bourgeois 
i was telling mademoiselle said he that m pons's pictures were worth that sum to me but the prices of works of art have risen so much of late that no one can tell how much the collection might sell for at public auction the sixty pictures might fetch a million francs several that i saw the other day were worth fifty thousand apiece it is a fine thing to be your heir remarked old cardot looking at pons my heir is my cousin cecile here answered pons insisting on the relationship there was a flutter of admiration at this she will be a very rich heiress laughed old cardot as he took his departure camusot senior the president and his wife cecile brunner berthier and pons were now left together for it was assumed that the formal demand for cecile's hand was about to be made no sooner was cardot gone indeed than brunner began with an inquiry which augured well i think i understood he said turning to madame de marville that mademoiselle is your only daughter certainly the lady said proudly nobody will make any difficulties pons good soul put in by way of encouraging brunner to bring out his proposal but brunner grew thoughtful and an ominous silence brought on a coolness of the strangest kind the presidente might have admitted that her little girl was subject to epileptic fits the president thinking that cecile ought not to be present signed to her to go she went still brunner said nothing they all began to look at one another the situation was growing awkward camusot senior a man of experience took the german to madame de marville's room ostensibly to show him pons's fan he saw that some difficulty had arisen and signed to the rest to leave him alone with cecile's suitor designate here is the masterpiece said camusot opening out the fan brunner took it in his hand and looked at it it is worth five thousand francs he said after a moment did you not come here sir to ask for my granddaughter inquired the future peer of france yes sir said brunner and i beg you to believe that no possible marriage could be more flattering to my vanity i shall never find any one more charming nor more amiable nor a young lady who answers to my ideas like mademoiselle cecile but oh no buts old camusot broke in or let us have the translation of your buts at once my dear sir i am very glad sir that the matter has gone no further on either side brunner answered gravely i had no idea that mademoiselle cecile was an only daughter anybody else would consider this an advantage but to me believe me it is an insurmountable obstacle to what sir cried camusot amazed beyond measure do you find a positive drawback in an immense advantage your conduct is really extraordinary i should very much like to hear the explanation of it i came here this evening sir returned the german phlegmatically intending to ask monsieur le president for his daughter's hand it was my desire to give mademoiselle cecile a brilliant future by offering her so much of my fortune as she would consent to accept but an only daughter is a child whose will is law to indulgent parents who has never been contradicted i have had the opportunity of observing this in many families where parents worship divinities of this kind and your granddaughter is not only the idol of the house but madame la presidente you know what i mean i have seen my father's house turned into a hell sir from this very cause my stepmother the source of all my misfortunes an only daughter idolized by her parents the most charming betrothed imaginable after marriage became a fiend incarnate i do not doubt that mademoiselle cecile is an exception to the rule but i am not a young man i am forty years old and the difference between our ages entails difficulties which would put it out of my power to make the young lady happy when madame la presidente always carried out her daughter's every wish and listened to her as if mademoiselle was an oracle 
what right have i to expect mademoiselle cecile to change her habits and ideas instead of a father and mother who indulge her every whim she would find an egotistic man of forty if she should resist the man of forty would have the worst of it so as an honest man i withdraw if there should be any need to explain my visit here i desire to be entirely sacrificed if these are your motives sir said the future peer of france however singular they may be they are plausible do not call my sincerity in question sir brunner interrupted quickly if you know of a penniless girl one of a large family well brought up but without fortune as happens very often in france and if her character offers me security i will marry her a pause followed frederic brunner left cecile's grandfather and politely took leave of his host and hostess when he was gone cecile appeared a living commentary upon her werther's leave-taking she was ghastly pale she had hidden in her mother's wardrobe and overheard the whole conversation refused she said in a low voice for her mother's ear and why asked the presidente fixing her eyes upon her embarrassed father-in-law upon the fine pretext that an only daughter is a spoilt child replied that gentleman and he is not altogether wrong there he added seizing an opportunity of putting the blame on the daughter-in-law who had worried him not a little for twenty years it will kill my child cried the president and it is your doing she exclaimed addressing pons as she supported her fainting daughter for cecile thought well to make good her mother's words by sinking into her arms the president and his wife carried cecile to an easy chair where she swooned outright the grandfather rang for the servants 